Good morning, sixth grade. Today's Wednesday, and um, we're going to get this day started off with a bang. This morning, um, if you'll get your Bibles out for me, I want to read in Psalms today just a little bit. Um, not really have a devotion, but I really want to read a chapter in Psalms that's very prevalent for this time, very important for this time. So I'm going to give you a minute to get your Bibles out, and I want you to read this along with me. We've read it in class before. Brother Preston has read it several times during our family devotions um, during this time of quarantine, during this time of the coronavirus. Brother Carpenter, our pastor at FAC, has read it several times um, at our online services. It is a chapter of comfort. It is a chapter that kind of eases our fears, that reminds us of the promises of the Lord. And I just had this on my heart this morning during our, my prayer time. So I wanted to share this with you and I wanted you to read it along, read along with me. If there's anything that really speaks to you as we're reading along in Psalms 91, you're welcome to underline it in your Bible. So the next time you're skimming through your Bible, it might pop out at you at an important time when you need it. So we're going to start at the top of Psalms 91. Hope everybody's there in your Bible. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it, and it doesn't matter what that it is, whatever it, the fear might be to you, but it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you. That is a scripture that I have held on to so many times in my life for myself, for my children, and for my students, for he shall give his angels charge over you. I shared a little bit of that in language yesterday, where I feel that was um, certainly happened in my lifetime to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Excellent, excellent verse for an antidote for fear. Um, there's a little devotion here in my Bible next to it. It says, if you struggle with fear, the 16 verses of this psalm would be good for you to memorize. The first step to overcoming fear is to dwell in the secret place of the Most High or to make sure that you live in a close relationship with the Lord. Brother Carpenter spoke on our online revival last night about getting up of a morning and making your bed. And he didn't mean about your physical bed, but he meant about your spiritual bed of starting your day off right with prayer. And if you want a close relationship with the Lord, that is the best place to start is starting your day with prayer. Let's do that now. Let's bow our heads. Um, before we pray, I just want to make mention of all of you and tell all of you that I'm praying for you every day. I'm praying for Addison and Lucas and Jacob and Owen and Ariana and Carly and Caitlin Hannah and Carson and Matthew and Lavinia. 
I'm praying for Callaway and Caitlin Coombs and Natalie and Caitlin Hanna and Ella and Carly. I might be saying some of you twice and Hunter and Owen and now I've lost count here, Brianna and Daniel and Addison and Lucas and I'm probably saying you twice. <laughs> but I do want you to know that I'm praying for all of you, all 19 of you and your family. So let's take these needs before the Lord. Lord, I'm taking my students before you this morning, asking that you help them on their work today, asking you that you help them during this time of not much to do and not many places to go. Lord, help them to keep their minds busy in a positive way. Lord, I pray that you will strengthen them during this time. I pray that you will Help them to draw closer to you, Lord, which is the most important thing, and let them feel your presence. I ask that you will help them on their schoolwork today to do their very best. I pray that you will watch over and keep us. Let us feel your presence in our homes at this time. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for Calvary. I thank you, Lord, because you've done so many things in my life, Lord, that I am so undeserving of, and I just want to thank you for that today. Lord, I want each of my students to feel my love for them today. I want them to feel your love for them today. I pray that you be with us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And I will meet you in math. All right, let's get started on math. You had a worksheet 97 to do yesterday. I hope you all did well on that. I will be grading that and getting that back to you. Today we're picking up on page 233. Everybody go ahead and open up to that. Just working on our angles some more, working on measuring them. Um, we have really been measuring most of our angles in a circle. Today we're gonna start measuring most of them out of a circle. Uh, yesterday, we or Monday, I'm sorry, we also really talked about um, the names of our angles. We talked about less than 90 degrees was so cute. It was a cute little angle. More than 90 degrees was obtuse like a big beluga whale. And 90 degrees, that's hard for me to do with my hands, is a right angle. And we have a straight angle of 180 degrees. So um, make sure you remember those angle names. Always important, a little bit more of a review. If you're measuring an angle, line up your vertex of your protractor with the vertex of your circle. Let's go ahead and, um, excuse me, hop right to our box, page 233, yellow box. And of course we already know number one. <coughs> Protractors measure the degrees in an angle, and you know that. Number two, the vertex letter is the middle letter when reading the name of an angle. <clears throat> Excuse me. We talked about this last week, I believe, but any time that we are reading the name of an angle, angle, let's just make one up, X, Y, Z, the middle letter is always going to be the vertex. It's not the vertex on this one because this is an example for another one. But the middle letter will always be your vertex. It's very important to remember because you'll be reading many angles and you need to know that that letter is your vertex. Number three, two intersecting lines form opposite and congruent angles. This is new. So there's an example of that. You have two intersecting lines. Remember intersecting means they cross. If they are opposite one another, they're going to be congruent or the same. For example, angle AOB is congruent to angle COD. Angle AOC is congruent to angle BOD, and they are opposite one another. Let's go back up to the other two. I think they're red. They're red in my book. They might be a little orange in your book. Um, in our yellow box. Angle ABC is an acute angle. It is 45 degrees. It is less than 90. Therefore, it is a cute little angle. Angle RST is an obtuse angle having 120 degrees. S is the vertex of angle RST. It is the middle letter. It is the vertex. Let's go on down to class practice. I hope that everyone's watching our videos each day because I did tell you that I will tell you on YouTube 
what numbers need to go on paper and what numbers need to go on your book. This is so important that you put your name on every single paper. I cannot give you a grade if your name is not on the paper because I don't know whose is whose because I have 19 of you. So make sure your name is on your paper because I take everything out of folders and I lay it all out. I put all the math together, all the language together, and then I grade. So don't think, oh, my name's on my folder. No, 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 no. Put your name on your paper. Also put your page number. So go ahead and get out a clean sheet of notebook paper for math today. Put your name in the top right hand corner along with math, page 233 and 234. Give you a minute to do that. Not giving you any circled review work today. Hope everybody's saying, thank you, Sister Presson. We love you, Sister Presson. I know, I love you guys too. All right, here we go. Um, number one says, use the protractor to measure these angles. So you have angle A, O, G. I'm going to do this one with you. My board's getting kind of full. Let's do this. I wanna be where you can see me. Really quickly, close your eyes for a minute. I'm gonna draw this angle out because I should have already had it done. And I did it. My marker's already going out on me. So we have angle AOC. Can everybody see this? A, wow, O, C. So this is A in your book. I'm gonna do this one with you so you don't have to um, do this one on paper. I'm gonna line up my vertex with my vertex, which is O. Follow my line out to my zero or my 10 side, not my 180 side. And I'm gonna go up, 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 up on my zero side. Let me line this up a little bit better. And I am at 60 degrees. So angle AOC is 60 degrees. If you said that your angle was 120 degrees, you looked at the wrong scale. And remember, look at angle AOC. It's a cute little angle, so it has to be less than 90 degrees. So you would automatically know 120 degrees is the wrong answer. I'm looking at the wrong scale. Go to 60 degrees. All right, so on your paper, I want you to put number one, and then I want you to label B, C, D, E, and F. I want all of those on your notebook paper so that I can grade them this next week. It does not matter which ray you put your protractor on. You can put it on this ray right here instead of on the bottom one and still follow this line out to zero and go up to, let me line up correctly, and go up to 60. So either ray is fine. You will end up with the same answer if you follow your correct scale. Um, I'm gonna, you can pause me while you do those, but I'm gonna go on, continue down to number two. You also need to have number two on your notebook paper. So put two, A, B, C, and D. The only thing you're doing on this one is naming each of those angles. If you can't remember their names, go back in your book, look at your yellow boxes and look those up. I'm gonna go on down to number three. You do not have to do number three on paper, but I do want you to write it in your book. Let's just go over this together. Number three says, write the number of right angles in each figure. This is so easy. Remember we said right angles were, um, they, sh they proved to us that it's a right angle by the little box in the corner. Right here, how many little boxes do we have on 3A? We have four boxes, so we have four right angles. How about on our triangle? This is actually called a right triangle. We haven't gotten into triangles too much yet. But how many right angles are in our right triangle? You guessed it, one. And C, how many on C? I hope I heard Lavinia shout out two. That is correct. Now, this one, we don't have an actual shape. We have intersecting lines, but how many right angles did our intersecting lines make? And I hope that I heard Ariana shout out 
four, four right angles. So number three does not need to be on your notebook paper. Let's go over and look at your syllabus says 234, number four. This is very easy. I do want this on your notebook paper. I'm gonna go through A with you. So put four A, B, C, and D on your notebook paper. All you're doing here is using the letters to write two names for each angle. Up here I have angle A, O, C. Wow, my, my marker is just, let me try a little, give it a few exercises here. See if that helps any, and not at all. Angle A, O, C. However, I could also call it angle, you see that up here, C, O, A. Like if I called Lucas, Lucas Gage Stinnett, I guess I could go backwards and call him Stinnett Gage Lucas. It's still his name, right? So that's, the, what, you, that's what you need on your angles. I'm gonna do A with you. So the way we would normally read it, I think we would put our angle mark. Oh, my marker's coming back to life. Angle W-O-Y is one name that we can give it. Or we can call it angle Y-O-W. Yow! So that's how you do four. Go ahead and name B, C, and D on your paper as well. And you can pause me to do that. Also, it's said to do number five in your syllabus. And you're going to do all of number five on paper. But of course, I'm gonna do the first one with you. I have an example of five on my board. So let me erase this and get it out of our way. So I have my circle here. My vertex in the middle is O. Hope you can see that. I tried to do this similar to the board um, or to what's in your book, but it probably won't be perfect. But it's telling me first of all to measure angle A, O, B. That's probably the easiest one, the way it's placed in your circle. So let's go up to angle A, O, B, vertex on vertex, following my line over to my zero scale, going up, 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 and I'm gonna kind of move mine so it goes to the direction that yours does. And it says that angle AOB is 60 degrees. And that's the one on your book also is 60 degrees. So on letter A, you want to put 60 degrees. Now, I want to show you how you're going to move your protractor to measure BOC and so on. To measure BOC, you can put your protractor on either radius. I think this is the easiest one to put it on. So we have angle BOC. B O C, putting it on here, following it on over to my zero, going up to see where they meet. Next, and you fill in that answer, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Next is angle C O D, C O D, putting my protractor. It's kind of funny how you have to turn them upside down, that's why I'm wanting to show it to you. Vertex on vertex, following my line over to zero, going up, up, up till it meets, and that will be angle C, O, D. I'll do one more with you, although I'm not actually giving you your answers. Angle D, O, E, I'm gonna turn my protractor again. D, O, E, vertex on vertex, going out to D to my zero side. This time my zero side is up top, up, 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 up to where they meet and putting the answer. And then I will do the exact same thing with angle EOA. I hope that helps you because I know we're turning our protractor that whole time and that's kind of new for you. So no circled problems today because I'm awesome. No, not really. But I just didn't want to give you too much today um, after you did all of that worksheet yesterday. So I will see you in language, sixth grade. Hope you enjoyed that math lesson. I love measuring angles. I hope you do too. All right, we're moving into language. Yesterday we started on adjectives and I told you how much I love adjectives because they help us paint a word picture. And that's my favorite thing. Add the details, they make me happy. We had several questions that adjectives cover 
and I want to review those really quickly. Which one, what kind, how many, how much, and whose. If they answer any of those questions, then they are definitely an adjective. And I want to read a silly little book to you real quick about adjectives. It's called The Bug Book. I'm going to try to come up close so you can see everything. The Bug Book about adjectives. Adjectives are awesome. There's just no doubt about it. They take a noun, any noun, and tell us more about it. These bugs will demonstrate for you just what an adjective can do. Here's some adjectives up here. Awesome, terrific, great, fabulous. Here's ways to describe bugs. Clean bug, mean bug. An adjective is a word that describes a noun such as a bug. Clean and mean are both adjectives. Gigantic, friendly, green bug. Can you th think of some other adjectives that might describe these bugs? How about this one? Little, purple, dotted. Adjectives describing our bugs. Strong bug. <laughs> Look at those little itsy bitsy tiny muscles. A long bug. So our adjectives here are strong and long. Annoying tag along bug. Whenever we talk about annoying, we're usually talking about your siblings. You, you always describe your siblings in sixth grade as annoying. So that's an adjective. Sticky bug or a picky bug. Speedy bug or a greedy bug. Lots of adjectives end in the letter Y. Not all of them, but lots of them. Outrageous bug, contagious bug. We've heard a lot about a contagious bug in the news here lately. So outrageous, contagious are adjectives. Bug is our what? Shout it out to me, Hunter. Bug is our noun. Heroic and courageous bug. This is super bug. Sometimes you can make an adjective out of a noun or a verb by adding special endings. Um, instead of hero, which makes him a noun, he is now a heroic bug, which makes heroic an adjective. I don't want to go over all of those today. I don't want to confuse you. Silly bug. Some of you are definitely silly bugs at time. Silly bug and a chili bug. A surprised bug or a disguised bug. <clears throat> Gymnastic bugs. Elastic bugs. They look more snaky than buggy to me. So gymnastic and elastic are both describing our nouns of bugs, making them adjectives. Many enthusiastic bugs. Hooray for adjectives. Can you think of adjectives to describe each of these bugs? Well, that one would certainly be a furry bug. This one looks like maybe a dirty bug. This one looks like an active bug. Uh-oh, Lucas and Daniel, there's a musical drum bug. All of those words are adjectives. You, when you want to modify a noun, an adjective won't let you down. Try adding adjectives. They're incredible at making nouns unforgettable. Super, fantastic, marvelous, and incredible. And these are adjectives I think of when I think of my sixth graders. So, um, adjectives make life more exciting. Let's open up in your books to page 189, I believe is on your syllabus. And again, I said, make sure that you are listening to YouTube each day so you know what goes on paper and what goes in your book. We're going to go on up to trying to remember how far we, oh, yesterday all we did was think A. So let's do think B on page 189. Ooh, I needed some of this in think B page 189. Let's see. Let's do this one together in your book. Let's do this one together. All right. Um, don't do this one on paper just because I think it would take a little too much time. Let's read our directions together first. Underline all the adjectives in the following sentences. Be ready to tell your teacher the noun or pronoun that each adjective modifies, and sadly you won't be able to do that because we're not together. Number one, the ancient bell was rusty and silent. 
I'm going to give you a hint that there are four adjectives in this sentence. Try to find them. They're going to be describing your noun. They will answer these questions. I'll give you a minute to look for those. I'm going to go over that with you. The word the is always an adjective. Can anybody tell me what the special word for it is? What kind of adjective is it? It is called an, I hope you're shouting out, article. We talked about that yesterday. A, an, and the are always adjectives and they're called articles. So I hope you underlined that. Also, ancient is describing our noun bell. So ancient is a is an adjective. Remember we said adjectives could come before your noun, but they can also come after. So what other adjectives do we have describing bell? It was a rusty bell and a silent bell. So in number one, you should have the, ancient, rusty, silent, all underlined. They are all adjectives describing the noun bell. Number two, a famous baseball player spoke to the sports club at school. Hint, one, two, three, four, five adjectives in this sentence. If you need to pause me to underline them, you're welcome to do that. Let's go with the first part of the sentence. We know that the word a or a, however you want to say it, is an article, therefore it is an adjective. It needs to be underlined. Now, how about the word famous? Is it describing anything? Yes, it is. It's describing player. What kind of a player? A famous player. So we're underlining famous. What about baseball? Is it describing anything? Yes, it is. Again, what kind of a player? A baseball player. So we're underlining it as an adjective. Um, player spoke to, none of those are adjectives. The sports club at school, any adjectives there? Um, the is always an adjective. It's one of our three short articles. I hope you underlined that. Also sports, is sports describing anything here or is it being used as a noun? Actually, it's being used as an adjective and it's describing what? I hope you're all saying club. That's your four adjectives in that sentence and I wish we were together so I could see on your faces if you're understanding this. Number three, Robert Peel, a devout Christian, founded the London Police Force. First of all, we know Robert Peel is a what? He's a person, so he's a noun. Not even looking at him as an adjective. A devout Christian. A is one of our articles. I hope you underlined it. Devout is describing what? It's describing Christian. So yes, it is an adjective. What kind of Christian? A devout Christian. Um, founded is one of our verbs here. So the rest of our sentence, we have the London police force. The, automatically underlining, we know it's an article, therefore it's an adjective. Um, London, is London describing anything? It is a place, but actually here, it's not place such as in a noun. It's actually describing which force, the London force. And police is also a noun, but here it's being used as an adjective describing which force, police force. So in number three, you should have underlined A, devout, the London police as adjectives. Number four, 10 people trusted Christ as savior during the church revival meetings. Anytime you see a number, it is most likely going to be an adjective. How much? 10, how many? 10. So we're underlining 10 as an adjective. Um, any other adjectives that you're seeing? I see the word the, always an adjective. It's an article, make sure you underline that. And church is describing what noun? Describing meetings, what kind of meetings? Church meetings. Revival's also an adjective. Again, what kind of meetings? Revival meetings. So our adjectives here are 10, the church revival. Always go through these questions to help yourself find your adjectives. Number five, three Hebrew children were thrown into a fiery furnace by Nebuchadnezzar's servants. Oh, there's a number. I told you a number is always going to be an adjective. How many Hebrew children? Three. We're underlining that. Now, Hebrew here is describing what? 
Which children? Hebrew children. So yes, Hebrew is an adjective. Um, we have another adjective. I see an article of what? Uh, yes, underline that. What kind of furnace? What kind of furnace? A fiery furnace. Therefore, fiery is describing furnace. It's an adjective. Now, here's Nebuchadnezzar's name. Normally, if we see Nebuchadnezzar, he's going to be a noun. But what is Nebuchadnezzar actually doing here? It's describing the noun servants. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar is an adjective. So adjectives in number five. Three, Hebrew, a fiery Nebuchadnezzar. Um, list that the three proper adjectives in think be. Let's just do this in your book as well. Um, proper adjectives are going to be capitalized. So what three do you see? I hope that Brianna is saying London, Hebrew, and Nebuchadnezzar. Let's go down to our yellow box. Read that along with me as I read it. Possessive nouns and possessive pronouns are called adjectives when they come before nouns. They always answer the question, whose? Is this your ticket? Your is an adjective since it comes before a noun. Is this ticket yours? Here's where language grammar gets tricky. Yours is a possessive pronoun here since it comes bef um, since it does not come before a noun. Is this Logan's ticket? Whose ticket? Logan's is possessive here, therefore it is an adjective. You may have Logan's. Logan's is a possessive noun since it does not come before the noun. So if it's possessive, it must come before the noun to be considered an adjective. Very important that you understand this. Let's look at the bold black. This, that, these, those, whose, which, what, and other words which function as pronouns can also be adjectives when they come where? Before your noun. This game is fun. Here's your pronoun of this. Here it's being used as an adjective because it's describing what? Game. However, this is a funny game. It's not describing game. It's acting as a pronoun here. That's where we have to get out our magnifying glass, really look at our context clues in our sentence to decide how it's working in our sentence. Let's go down to think C. And think C, I do want on paper. Um, so go ahead and um, get your notebook paper out. Language in the top right hand corner, page 189, think C. Identify the underlined word by writing noun, N for noun, P for pronoun, or ADJ for adjective in the blank. Now, you're really going to have to do some detecting on this and ask yourself these important questions that we have gone over today of what each one, of what place each one plays in the sentence. I'm going to do number one and two with you and then I want you to do the rest on your notebook paper. Number one, what day is it? Now we have a pronoun here of what. It comes before our noun here. So according to our yellow box, if it comes before our noun, it is definitely going to be an adjective. Number two, the red car is hers. Here we have a pronoun of hers, but does it come right before our noun? No, it does not. Therefore, it's acting as a pronoun. So, um, you have three, four, five, and six left to do on your own. I will tell you only one of them on one through six is a noun. That might give you a little help. So if you wanna pause that and do that on your own, you can. However, I'm gonna go on over to page 190, so come back and join me after you have that finished. Page 190 at the top, lots of reading here today, um, so stay with me as, and read with me. Adjective forming suffixes. Adjectives are easily recognized because of their location in a sentence. Before nouns, or after linking verbs. I wanna say that again because they're much easier to find in a sentence 
when you get these two rules down in, deep in your smart brain. Adjectives are easily recognized because of their location in a sentence. They are either before nouns or after linking verbs. Another way to spot an adjective is to learn to recognize some common adjective endings. Study this list and see if you can add to them. So some of our um, adjective endings are A-B-L-E, I-B-L-E, A-R-Y or O-R-Y or just A-R down at the bottom, A-N-T, E-N-T, F-U-L, and O-U-S. You will recognize many of these endings from our spelling words. Our spelling words have several of these endings. So here's the A-B-L-E list. It says study these lists and see if you can add to them. Acceptable, available, dependable, valuable, respectable, washable, movable. I could put a noun behind every one of those words and it would become an adjective with those endings. So let's try it. Um, let's say um, store, it's a place. Acceptable store, available store, dependable store, valuable store, respectable store, washable store, or movable store. I guess if we used our imagination, we could think about moving the store, yes. Um, here's what I want you to do on your notebook paper. I'm gonna have you do the rest of this work on your own. You need to fill in other words with each one of these endings. You do not have to do all four lines. So here's how I want you to work it on your paper. Let me write it down for you. So you can put study, this one's called study, on your notebook paper just so I'll know. Study page 190. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on down. You probably can't see that. Um, so next to number one, I want you to put able. Go ahead and put every chart next to a number. Able. Airy or ori. <laughs> Everybody see how I'm doing that so I know which one you're talking about? Next to that, I want you to give me two more words. You don't have to do four, there's four lines there. I want you to give me two more words that you can think of that end in able. I want you to give me two more words that you can think of that end in ible, and airy, and ori, and are, and ant, and int, and full, and us, and so on. I hope you all understand that. I'm gonna give you an example on able. Um, another word, that's not on that list is capable. So you only have to do one more word for A-B-L-E. Hope everybody understands how I want this on your notebook paper. This is for a grade, so make sure you get it done. If you need to ask a family member to help you out with some of these and give you some ideas, go ahead and do that. If it helps to maybe Google some words or use a dictionary, I don't mind if you do that either. You just want to get your ending correctly on those. And that's where we're, oh, we're not stopping today there in language. No more work though, just talk. On your syllabus, I said that you had a chance to earn a prize today. So when you see this, the very first person that texts me and tells me what they think is in my bag, I wins it and I will send it home with you in the next folder. Um, I have a bag with a question mark in the middle with something inside. What is inside, I'm describing on the outside with adjectives. So again, if you think you know what it is, you need to text me and tell me the first person who gets it correct, I will send home. This is my phone number, so write it down really quickly. 865-621-8443. When you text me, tell me who you are in case I don't have that parent phone number in my um, contact. So tell me who you are and tell me your guess. So here's my bag and I'm gonna read them to you. My adjectives are small, can't even read my own writing, I'm gonna have to come up here. Small, round, many, 
fruity, red, orange, purple, bite size, green, and yellow. I'm gonna say those adjectives again. Small, round, many, fruity, red, orange, purple, yellow, green, bite size. So what do you think is in my bag? Text me, let me know. I will send it home to the winner. And I will see you next in history. You'll notice on your syllabus for today that you have a current event due. And I said that I would provide the worksheet, but guess what, I did not. However, I did put it on Jupiter yesterday. The format is the exact same that we've been doing all year long. Um, I will need your name and your source and all of that. Um, I believe I talked to you about it yesterday as well, but that's what you're doing today for history. Your topic is COVID-19. Can be anything about it, something positive, something that's been happening in the news with it, the quarantine, that is entirely up to you. Um, but please make sure you follow the format that I have asked you to use on Jupiter. And we are moving into reading next. So we're going from history to reading today. And um, yesterday you did some reading aloud to your family members and I hope you finished that. Today you have a read and think to do. So go ahead and get that done and put that in your folder to return to me on Friday. And let's open up to page 82 in of America. Cheerfulness, oh my. What a wonderful thing to talk about. We all need a little cheerfulness in our lives, don't we? This is Cheerfulness by Margaret, Margaret Slattery. I'm gonna read this, so follow along as I read. There once lived a woman who thought she had the very hardest cross in all the world. No one suffered as she did, she thought, and no one was as lonely as she. Her eyes were often filled with tears. Her whole attitude cast a gloom over all who came near. And so people began to avoid her. One night, as she lay thinking about it, with great bitterness in her heart, comparing her heavily burdened life with the lives of other women she knew, she heard a voice saying, you may exchange your cross, see? And she seemed to see a great room, all of marble, pure and white. And around on the walls hung crosses of every size and made of every sort of material. Now I'm gonna stop right there and explain to you that a cross is something that we bear, like Jesus bore the cross of our sins. A cross is a burden that we have or a problem that we have. We consider it a heavy load. So I hope that makes a little more sense. There, said the voice, exchange your cross. Each of these belongs to someone in the world. Many, like you, desire an easy one. All must have something in life that is hard. No one escapes. But if your cross seems indeed unbearable, choose another. Very interesting thought. Gladly she went about the room trying the crosses. They were so deceptive. The tiniest one, which she thought would be so easy, seemed like iron when she carried it. And one of gold that looked very beautiful and bore many jewels hurt so deeply that she laid it quickly aside. All night she tested the crosses. And when the gray morning light came into the marble room, she went to the man at the door and said, Oh, sir, I pray you, give me back my own cross. The man whose voice had spoken to her in the night drew his robe about him, smiled and answered, That is what all who say who enter here. Take it and bear it courageously. It is a story, a dream, but yet it is true. If we realize the great fact that all suffer, all have difficulties and trials, 
all have longings that are unsatisfied and that there is no reason why we should escape. It will help us hush the word of complaint upon our lips and change our frown to a smile. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who see clouds and those who see through clouds. Each one of us has to decide for himself to which class he will belong. Those who look through the clouds, be they soft and filmy or heavy and dark, always see the sun. I love that. It is there. It is always there, always shining. They know that clouds always move on and they wait, hoping that that today they may pass. If not today, then surely tomorrow. And tomorrow they have the same hope. And at last the day comes when the sun in all its glory shines upon them. These are the people it is good to meet in homes and in schoolrooms, in offices and shops behind counters and on street corners, everywhere in the world. They are the ones who should be awarded a medal or a prize in gold. All those who meet the world with a cheerful face and a voice that makes all hard things seem easier because of the note of faith and hope there is in it. They are the ones without whom happiness would be impossible. One can no more think of life without these smiling faces than of a world without air, with no stars and no sun. Out in the world are clouds, hard things as well as easy. No one wishes to be deceived about that. And out there cheerfulness is a great asset. Secure it at any price. I love that reading. Let's go down to time to think. Do you think the woman in this story changed after her dream? What do you think? I think she did change. How do you think she was different? Hmm. I think she probably didn't complain as much. I think her eyes were finally open to the fact that everybody has a hard life and that sometimes we think ours is the worst, but when we see others, we think, Wow, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not suffering like that person is suffering. Number two, why is it important for you to be cheerful? Oh, I hope you're thinking of a million things about this. Um, it is important to be cheerful for those around us. It is, be, it is important to be cheerful because it lifts our spirits. It puts us in a better frame of mind than when we're all, always, oh, what do my boys call it? Oh, they call it Debbie Downer. You're just being a Debbie Downer. Don't be a Debbie Downer. Be cheerful. We all have burdens to bear. And yes, I will agree, sometimes they are hard. I personally know that many of you in my class are going through some very tough situations, tough family situations, tough health situations, but let's try to look on the bright side. Awesome, awesome reading lesson today. Um, I love that story. We all have a cross to bear, but I think we'd rather bear our own cross than anyone else's. So that is history and reading for today. You don't have any homework in those at all. And we're going to move on to health. And I will read that with you today if you would like for me to. You've had a pretty easy Wednesday, I would say, so far. And I'm glad about that because I don't want this to be too difficult. So I will meet everybody in health. Yesterday in health, you read pages 31 to 34. You did a quick checkup in your books on page 34. So if you'll open to that, I want to go over, the, go over those answers with you just to make sure you got those correct. We talked about sports injuries yesterday. Wow. Um, very important because half of my class my sixth graders are very involved in sports. So these are very important for you to know about, to help yourself, to help your friends that are in sports. Number one, let's go over quick checkup on page 34. Number one, a muscle pulled to the point of tearing is a strained muscle. That is true. Number two, a sprain affects only muscles that is false. Number three, it is important to warm up and stretch your muscles before exercise. I hope everybody put true on that. Very important. Number four, a simple fracture pier pierces through the skin. That is 
faults. Many of you already in your lifetime have had simple fractures. I think I looked on Caitlin or on YouTube this morning and Caitlin Hannah said she's already broken four bones. If I read that correctly, I did not know that about you, Caitlin. My goodness. Number five, a splint should prevent movement of a broken bone. That is true. Number six, a bone that is forced from its normal position is a fracture. And that is false. So we are opening up to page you're already opened up to page 34, I'm sorry. We're going down to skin deep irritations and I wanna read this with you today. So stay with me, follow along with me. Cuts and abrasions. Trevor's arm brushes an exposed nail while exploring an old barn. Justin slides into a home plate. To tie the score of the baseball game, Morgan turns a sharp corner and falls off of her bike. All of these activities are different Yet all three young people probably received the same kind of injury, a cut or an abrasion. And here's a tickle your funny bone question. How does a fish get a fish hook removed? Oh my goodness, this is just not all that funny. <laughs> Answer, it calls the rescue squid or a surgeon fish. Hardy har har har. Next page, page 35. And, and incised incised wound a wound any a wound is any break in the skin or mucous membrane highlight that for me a wound is any break in the skin or mucous membrane it has two dangers of bleeding of course and infection a cut sometimes called an incision occurs commonly during playtime often people get so involved in what they are doing that they fail to notice rocks sharp objects or other safety hazards in their play area. Most cuts are shallow and can be safely treated at home. Cleanse the area with soap and water, carefully washing away any dirt. The dirt can cause infection. If the wound continues to bleed, apply direct pressure to it. You want to push down on that wound um, until the bleeding stops. Be sure to put a sterile bandage on the wound. That means a clean bandage. If a cut is deep and bleeds heavily, it may require stitches. Control the bleeding by applying direct pressure to the wound and get to a doctor as quickly as possible. Many of you have had stitches um, before. Isabella has had stitches in her chin from where, ugh, from where she tripped. Um, on a rug, she had on some tennis shoes that kind of went under the rug and she tripped and she hit her chin on the hardwood and it just split it open. That's our only instance that we've had with stitches. An abrasive action, top of page 35. An abrasion occurs when the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, scrapes against a hard surface such as concrete. Highlight that, an abrasion occurs when the epidermis the outer layer of skin scrapes against a hard search surface such as concrete. Because you usually try to break a fall with your hands, knees, or elbows, these are the areas that are most likely to get scraped. Abrasions are often very painful because the scraping away of skin exposes the nerve endings. All of you have scraped the inside of your palms when you've fallen off of your bike or your elbows or your knees and they burn and they sting and they hurt because those nerve endings are right there on your skin. A scrape needs to be washed thoroughly just as you would a cut because dirt can be embedded in the skin from sliding across the hard surface. You should check carefully to make sure all particles of dirt are removed then bandage the wound so that it doesn't get infected. If a wound does become infective, it, infected, it will swell, it will be red, it will be very painful. It may even cause a fever and sometimes if it's infected, it's really warm to touch it. Um, and the presence of pus, which is gross, but it shows you that something's infected. It's a yellowish white sub substance on the wound. Um, and you need to see your doctor if it becomes infected. An annoying nosebleed. That's something many of you have had, especially with my students that suffer from allergies. Several of you do. Another injury often associated with sports activities is a nosebleed. A nosebleed may be caused by a nose injury or strenuous activity. 
as well as high blood pressure, exposure to high altitudes or blowing your nose too hard. A nosebleed is not necessarily serious, it's just a frustration, it's kind of embarrassing. Um, but if you should get a nosebleed, sit down and lean slightly forward to prevent any blood from running down in your throat. We tend to put our head back, but then that goes down into our throat. So kind of lean forward a little bit. Placing cold, wet cloths on your nose will help stop the bleeding. You should always pinch your no also pinch your nostrils together for 15 minutes. Everybody try that. <laughs> if the bleeding continues after the nostrils are released, pinch them together again for another 15 minutes. If heavy bleeding still persists or if your nose appears broken, you should consult a doctor. Be bzz, careful. I don't know of anyone who likes bees. Um, Sister Leslie Stinnett is very afraid of bees. <laughs> Some of you are allergic to bees, so you have a very real reason to be fearful of them. Any bee sting is painful. However, if you are allergic to bee venom or poison, a bee sting can be very serious and deadly. Someone with an allergic reaction may have difficulty breathing, begin to cough, complain of a headache, or actually lose consciousness. If so someone appears to be having an allergic reaction, you should find an adult and seek emergency attention immediately. If you get stung but are not allergic to bees, you should remove the stinger as quickly as possible by scraping it with your fingernail or a flat, sharp-edged object such as a credit card. I'm a little surprised that they put fingernail in our health book I don't really recommend that you scrape it with a fingernail because you might have dirt or something under your fingernail that could cause a problem there. But I guess if you don't have a credit card handy, a fingernail would do just as well. A stinger that is not removed continues to release venom into the body for several minutes. So you want to get that stinger out as soon as possible. After removing it, of course, you want to wash the area Cover it with a bandage, apply ice to relieve the swelling and the pain. A tick attack, and we talked about those earlier. A tick attack, a tick attack. That's fun to say. Uh, after a day of hiking or playing outdoors, what should you do if you find a tick attached to your skin? And summertime is coming and so are the ticks. Let's read our safety tip. Remove a tick quickly without squeezing it if possible. Squeezing the tick could cause it to inject harmful substances into your body, so you don't wanna squeeze it. It is impossible to remove the tick, I'm sorry. It is important, not impossible, important to remove the tick as quickly as possible. The best way to remove a tick is to grasp it with tweezers as close to the skin as possible and pull it straight out until it releases its hold. Wash again the area with soap and water. We seem to hear that one frequently. Apply antiseptic or antibiotic ointment. Ticks can be carriers of Rocky Mountain spotted fever and more commonly they're carry, uh, carriers of something called Lyme disease. Lyme disease can make you extremely, extremely sick. That is why you, do, you want to check for ticks at all times. All time. Symptoms of Lyme disease include a bright red ring on the skin, red spots and blotchy areas, severe headaches and pain in your joints. Because infection or disease may follow a tick bite, tick bite you should consult a doctor if you have any of these symptoms. If not treated, Lyme disease may result in arthritis, numbness, vision and hearing impairment and memory loss. So when we talk about ticks, we are not exaggerating the importance of checking for them when you're in the woods, when you're outside, if you're rolling around in the grass and some sticks. So very important. And we are stopping there today. Um, starting next week, we will be finishing up, I believe we're gonna finish up chapter two soon, maybe not. I thought we were. No, we have a ways to go. Never mind, forget what I was gonna say. <laughs> Tomorrow we'll pick up there at contact poisoning and this is the end of our day today again text me if you have figured out my adjective prize also if you did the art project yesterday I'd love to see a picture of it or if you do it anytime this week um, send me a picture of that as well at that same phone number and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon 
I will see you tomorrow morning, which is Thursday, getting us a little closer to the weekend. Try to get outside today. Uh, my battery's going dead, so it's a good thing we're at the end of our day. Try to get outside today. Um, take a walk, play some ball outside. Um, get some sunshine today. Uh, I love you all. Have a great evening.